hello. My name is Deborah McPhee, and it is my honor to serve as Dean of Fordham University's Graduate School of Social Service, or GSS for short. Uh, and welcome to what I know will be a memorable conversation with two extraordinary women. I think it's uh, fitting for GSS to host tonight's conversation for a couple of reasons, but certainly because the lives and careers of both of our, our speakers exemplify the focus and the values of the social work profession and certainly social work education. Uh, for starters, uh, social work is a unique profession uh, among the professions in that it, it's focused on social justice and uh, care for the most vulnerable in our society. Um, like our speakers, our social workers uh, occupy multiple roles, practitioner, therapist, advocate, change agent, and sometimes all in the same day. <laughs> uh, and social workers understand that our context and our environment uh, shape our li all of our lives. It's how we think about, how we construct ideas and the way we think about uh, race or gender or poverty. These determine the systems that we create and those systems ultimately govern the lives of individuals and families and communities. Uh, so thank you, thank you both uh, to both of our speakers tonight for, for being important role models to our social work students who themselves wanna make a positive and meaningful difference in the, in the world. Uh, while I'm expressing gratitude, I want to thank our GSS staff, uh, all those folks that uh, have worked so hard for weeks and months behind the scenes to pull all the pieces together for our gathering. So thank you for all of your efforts. Uh, and of course, I want to introduce our distinguished speakers. Lynn Slater has worn many hats uh, and reinvented herself in many ways over the course of her incredible career. Uh, in her 20-year career as a professor, Dr. Slater has influenced social work education well beyond the classroom and her legacy here at Fordham. Uh, she has profoundly influenced literally thousands of students who have taken Lynn's wisdom and their, her skills into their work and the lives of the people that they serve. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, but Lynn Slater's contributions have never been uh, confined to one arena. Uh, she is a rare individual who his commitment and ability to embrace change uh, is always astounding. And it's no wonder that she has become an influencer in many other arenas with global visibility. Uh, I know Lynn as a uh, cherished, exceptional educator, but as a cherished colleague and a friend. Uh, I'm proud to welcome you uh, home, Lynn, and have this opportunity to celebrate your soon to be released book, uh, How to Be Old, Lessons in Living Boldly from the Accidental Icon. It's a wonderful achievement to add to the many achievements uh, in your in your career. So welcome home. Thank you, Deborah. It's good to be home. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce our other extraordinary speaker, Christine Platt. Christine is known as an Afro minimalist and is a multi-talented author and uh, advocate who's carved her own unique path in the world of literature and social change. She is a powerful voice and writer uh, with a commitment to amplifying, amplifying um, marginalized voices and exploring the nuances of race, identity, and social justice. She herself is a much sought after speaker who has achieved international acclaim for her powerful talks and her workshops. Um, this is not surprising, as you will see tonight. Christine Platt radiates positive, contagious energy, uh, and she possesses a rare ability to invite and engage meaningful conversations. Christine, uh, we are very grateful for your help in facil facilitating tonight's discussion. Uh, Lynn yeah. and Christine, I want to thank you for inviting us into the conversation, uh, and most importantly, for the extraordinary integrity and the difference that you both make in the world. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a beautiful introduction. And just know, I am so happy to be here. This is an honor. Uh, Lynn is a dear friend of mine, and um, you know what we really envision tonight to be is kind of just like one of our Sunday afternoon discussions where we talk about anything and everything. And um, you know, I think a great place to start, Lynn, is how we actually met. We actually met on social media. Um, I met Lynn as the accidental icon. She met me as the Afro-minimalist um, influencers, um, a word that we both like, anyway. Um, and, so, <laughs> and so we ended up like really developing a friendship over um, what we were experiencing during that time. 
And the more we got to talk and the more we got to know each other, we were just like, what are we doing? And so, Lynn, I would love for you to really start the conversation with letting people know who you were before Accidental Icon, because I'm sure, like me, there are many people who are watching tonight who only know you as Accidental Icon, and then sort of how you became Accidental Icon. And then I think that sort of, you know, leads our discussion into what it means to reinvent ourselves. Ah, oh, Christine, such a pleasure to have you with me. And I think my relationship with you is one of the positives of social media, because we're all now very much in a place where we're looking at the negatives. So mm -hmm. we can talk more about that, because I do think people have an interest in whether or how we use that in our activism and in our uh, sort of creative life. So, well, I guess uh, I have been a social worker for 47 years. Um, I started my career in 1975, 76, um, in a residential treatment center for adolescent girls. And uh, interestingly, my first master's was in criminal justice. Mm -hmm. And that's how I sort of got introduced. I had internships in uh, sort of facilities for delinquent girls at the time. And I was in my very last class of my master's and this famous psychiatrist who was the father of residential treatment started to talk about the youth, both young women and men, in a very different way than the criminal justice system was talking about it. And I became really, really interested in this idea of treatment versus punishment. And so as I worked in this residential treatment center, I began to see that a lot of the girls' behavior was coming from earlier experiences, earlier traumatic experiences, but was being criminalized, right? When it was actually responses to trauma. And so that kind of led me into social work. Right. I felt like social work was a better explanation. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of dove into the field of child welfare um, and continued to work with it within it as recently as three months ago when I stopped my last social work consultant job on a national child welfare workforce grant. But this is a very hard field to be in. Yeah. There is huge amounts of trauma that happen both in the personal lives of my clients and in the systems that they were engaged in. And trauma was often sort of re-perpetrated through these yeah. systems. And so in order for me to sustain, because I loved this practice at the same time, uh, in order for me to sustain myself in it, I had to sometimes go outside of it and do something, which I now identify as self-care, where I would involve myself in a creative experience. And that might have mm -hmm. been taking a creative writing class or taking an improv class or a class about theater and the use of that in order mm -hmm. to address oppression. And I would get very sort of rejuvenated by that experience. I would come back into the work and I would take that new creative experience, it kind of metabolized and it would find its way back into the work I was doing. And so just, I've done that repeatedly. You could call it a reinvention. I guess I was reinventing myself, but then reinventing my work 
so that I could continue to do it over time and continue to be present and a witness to some of the, you know, sort of suffering of the people I was working with, both what was happening in their personal life, but also the systems that they were involved in. And so just a quick example, I started to become a expert and specialist in child sexual abuse, which talk about heavy. Uh, and so what I ended up doing was creating this project with a theater group where we would go into residential treatment, foster care, and we would create a scenario where a foster mother and a child were having a conflict that related to a lack of understanding about what had happened. And then we stopped the action and the audience could talk to the characters. And so oh, you would wow. you would have a foster parent talking to a character and a, a child and saying, it's, it's not that I'm punishing you, I'm scared. I don't want this to happen to you again. And in that format, they were able to say things and see things that they couldn't see in the stress of everyday life. Right. I, I think, you know, again, this going outside and without a goal and putting myself into a different way of looking at what I was looking at in the everyday, mm -hmm. it really allowed me to come back to the work with a fresh perspective, to not feel like, oh, there's no solution to this problem. Yeah. And so I just kept doing that. I did the same thing when I was a professor. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I would, you know, improv classes made me a good professor. <laughs> yeah. And it almost like it ends up saving you in a way because we, you know, it was the same thing, you know, and I was doing anti-racism work and social justice work you know, it be, it can become so all consuming. And, you know, is that how Accidental Icon sort of came about? Was this sort of like, just supposed to be a creative expression? Because, I mean, that's what happened with Afro Minimalist, right? It was never, and I should also explain, you know, our visceral reaction to the word influencer, you know, <laughs> my... <laughs> <laughs> the the gesture that I made earlier and Lynn laughing about it. It's sort of like an inside joke between us, um, you know, because what ends up happening to, you know, even just to hear what the snippet of what you just shared about your career and the work that you've done and the lives that you just changed and have it reduced to this one online persona right like that is the part of influencing that is is troubling to us but um you know same thing for me with afro minimalist it was um a creative expression a way for me to you know chronicle my journey to minimalism but at the same time you know i was serving as managing director um of the anti-racism center right um and never expected it to become this sort of thing that was that I never intended it to be and to have my identity um, move from being, you know, historian, social justice advocate, you know, a, a senior policy advisor for the Department of Energy, all of this work that I had done over the years reduced to, you know, just this one account that was just showing images, you know, of my home and of my Afro minimalist life. And all of a sudden I was no longer Christine Platt. I was just the Afro minimalist, right? And you and I shared a, a, a similar journey. Um, and, you know, I'd love for you to share like just that moment when, you know, accidental icon went from being a, a creative outlet for you, something fun, just something to like take your mind 
away from the work and some of the things that you almost have to detach yourself from to be to be good um, at what you're doing and 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 doing a, a real service to your clients. When did that shift sort of happen for you? Like that first little that first little shift that made you say, "Ooh, I don't I don't know if I like this <laughs> as much as I used to." <laughs> well. One of the things that I have been blessed with throughout my career as a social worker is whether it's the vibe I put out or I'm not sure, but I have always been blessed with clients and colleagues and staff that have called me out when I need to be and students, right? And instead of dismissing them and saying, oh, you know, they don't really understand and et cetera, all the things that you do. Um, and that included when I was the accidental icon, because a pivotal moment for me was when I had done this commercial and in it, I'm very arrogantly saying, oh, age is just an illusion. <laughs> and for the first time since I had been doing Accidental Icon, which for the most part, I got a lot of positive feedback. So many women emailed me very angry, very mm. angry at me and saying, what are you doing saying that? It mm. is not an illusion for me. I have mm. to work until I'm 80. I'm struggling to keep a home, um, taking care of my husband who has a chronic illness. I'm also doing some on the side daycare for my grandchildren. And that is the reality of my aging life. Right. And a lot of people on social media, they would dismiss a person like that as being a troll and oh, they're just jealous and they want your lifestyle. But because I've had this lifelong experience of when someone's calling me out, first of mm -hmm. all, they're being brave enough to do so. Right. Second of all, they might have something important to say and I at least have to stop and mm -hmm. open my mind to it. So I ended up having an ongoing conversation with some of these women, and that was the beginning of when I realized that, and I think this is what you were talking about in your story, when someone else takes over the authorship of your life and is yeah. telling a narrative about you that you did not intend them to tell. Yeah. Yeah. And it is not your, your whole narrative. You know, um, one of the questions that we got, and I'm going to weave in some of the ev event questions into the conversation, because we want to make sure that we get to everyone. You know, we had a question, someone said that they followed us both on social media for year, years now, thank you to whoever that is. Um, and they asked, what's our current feeling about, you know, incorporating social media into this act of reinvention. And I think what you just said speaks so loudly to that, right? Um, a big part of our journey individually and together was how do we reclaim ourselves, right? And not just for ourselves, but also doing that boldly. And I know, you know, for me, it was a really big deal to change my handle from Afro minimalist to I am Christine Platt, you know, and the fear that went into that, you know, like social media, there's this weird social currency. There's a currency there that is not, I mean, like I can't pay my daughter's tuition with it, <laughs> but there's this like, there's a currency there. And I remember just feeling this fear like, oh my God, I'm going to lose all my followers. And then the immediate feeling was like, who cares, right? If it meant being true to myself, because what can happen for so many people is that it becomes 
a burden, right? It, it shifted from being this creativity process for self-care and this creativity process to sort of, you know, show people what it looks like to live with less to a burden, right? This is all you want me to post about. This is all you want me to talk about. And there are so many other aspects to me as a woman, as a daughter, as a friend, as a mother. Um, and so for me, you know, the answer to that question, you know, feeling about incorporating it into this act of reinvention, it was so important for me to do that boldly and for me to share with my followers why I was making this shift. I'm always going to be the Afro minimalist. I mean, I wrote a book called <laughs> The Afro Minimalist Guide to Living with Less. Shameful plug there. I'm going to always be the Afro minimalist, right? But there are so many other aspects to me. And I didn't want that um, to get any more lost than it already had. And what was so interesting, and, and Lynn, you know this because I shared this with you, um, that I received so many DMs from other influencers who were like, oh my gosh, how did you get your handle changed? I am like, I know exactly where you are. Like I started this curly hair account and now all they want me to do is talk about curly hair. And I am also doing X, Y, and Z, you know? So what has, what, what is your current feeling about incorporating it into you know, this act of reinvention, which I feel like your book is going to be such a big part of that. I'm so excited for folks to read How to Be Old. Um, of course, I've been honored and privileged to get an early reading and to be a part of your writing process. But, you know, aside from the book or in addition to the book, like what, how, do you, how are you going to incorporate like just this act of reinvention into how are you going to use social media to, well, to share I, that? You know, first of all, I want to say that the book probably wouldn't have gotten written on time without you oh. <laughs> because I often pulled on your experience as a writer and being involved in publishing, which was very different and new compared to the academic world. Um, so I just want to thank you for that. You're so um, welcome. But, you know, this is very interesting because I'm struggling now that I have stopped being the accidental icon with what to do with my Instagram account. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, when they reinvent, they sort of erase their past and completely, you know, get rid of everything on their feed. And I think for me, I am who I am because of all these events that have happened to me, lucky accidents, mistakes, miscalculations, finding myself, losing myself. They are all part of my story. And mm -hmm. you once said something to me uh, when I was having a moment and, and you said to me, everything that has happened needed to happen for you to be here. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think even sort of my kind of losing myself in the later years into that influencer place, that gave me great comfort because I was not feeling good about it. Um, and so I haven't wiped out my Instagram account. Mm -hmm. And I think when I first started to use social media, it was about social connection. Yeah. And I would use it often, and I've kind of returned to that since I've stopped being the accidental icon to pose a question, mm -hmm. to ask people, what are you thinking about this? And I think that I can tell the value of a post that I put up by the length and the amount of comments that are more than just an emoji or a heart. Yeah. 
And I think that when you get way too big, you lose the best part of social media, which is to engage with a community of people to have a conversation. Yeah. And, and so as I'm thinking about how do I, or even should I continue mm -hmm. on Instagram as I'm making a transition into being a writer. And, and I think my book is really me loudly proclaiming that I am going to be the narrator of my life. Um, does it have a place? And so I really am thinking about that. And I'm doing little experiments, uh, sort of, okay, I'm talking about this, what's coming back to me? Yeah, I'm laughing because I did everything that you said. I remember um, <laughs> doing like a whole bunch of white squares just to like put all the Afro minimalist stuff below and I had like little squares that was like you know keep scrolling keep scrolling if you're looking for Afro you know like I tried everything and at the end of the day what worked best was me just being myself which is sometimes I post about Afro minimalist sometimes I post about other things that I'm doing but I think just showing that a big part of that was reclaiming myself and I think what was so powerful again, was hearing from other people who have followed my journey and just saying like, man, like, I am so proud of you, or I love how you did that, or that's such a great e example. I too have been feeling stuck, or I too have been feeling stagnant. And so I think social media has such a powerful role um, in the sense that we can show others how to, how to live, how to love, how to, I really don't believe in failure, right? So how to learn <laughs> yeah. from, you know, all of these lessons. And I, I do think there's something beautiful about watching it all play out online, right? So the folks that were there that <laughs> God helped them, you know, had to watch me post 30 white squares <laughs> <laughs> to sort of cleanse my social media to sort of see where I am now. I think all of that, um, is so important. You know, another question um, that we that we receive that I think sort of also leans into this part of the conversation is how to actually start a creative process for self care. Um, and I think this is always harder um, the the older we get, right? Um, because we move so far away from creativity and the things that we once valued as a creative outlet um, or even just something that brought us joy, um, you know, we tend to associate that with being lazy or procrastination or, you know, we have all these other terms that um, being creative, unless you are a creative, <laughs> you know, there's something wrong with that, right? Like, right. oh, you're not being productive. And I think there's so much harm in that. And I remember um, you were working on one section of your book and it was so powerful. It was about daydreaming, right? The importance of daydreaming. And I feel like creativity also plays a part in that. So can you speak to that? Like, um, and I'll share my thoughts as well, but like, how would you encourage someone to sort of, um, start this this process of using creativity as an act of self-care. Um, and I think it's so important because we do have a lot of social workers on here who likely were in the same place that you were in, you know, just feeling like overwhelmed and really needing a creative outlet. What sort of advice would you give them? I think the most important thing is that when I went outside into a creative space, I did not have an outcome in mind. And I think there's so much pressure in our work, in our roles to be productive, to be perfect, to do it right, et cetera. And that it really was just putting myself into a place that I was curious about, that maybe I had some passion about, 
you know, when I first uh, started um, taking classes at a fashion school, it really came from my curiosity about not fashion so much, but clothing mm. and the power that they had because I had experienced it in my own life with how I could influence how someone else saw me by what I wore. Right. And I saw it in my world of social work where people actually made huge decisions based on sometimes what people wore or how they right. presented. Like mm -hmm. I probably, re you know, went, read thousands of psychiatric and psychological reports. And in the first paragraph, they always say, client was well-dressed and mm. clean, right? And so mm. sometimes I would see one, oh, mother had stains and unkempt or whatever, but they didn't tell you that that mother had dropped off three special needs kids at school and had been right. up at 530 in the morning to make her appointment with you. Right. 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 So, so when I went, I had no idea that I was going to start a fashion blog, that I was going to do what I was going to do. It was just, let me go in. Let me see what I see. Let me be in spaces where I am around people who are different from me, different from how I think and how I view the world and how I move in the world. And let me see if there is something that can sort of allow me to let go and sort of forget myself. And I think you were alluding to play. It's very much like play right? But it really is not having an outcome. And yeah. I, I think that, you know, we work out things in relationship and in the process of doing. Right. And so this need for my self care, I didn't have an outcome or I'm going to do this to feel better or the manual for self care says I should go do this. It was, I'm going to be in relationship with people and I'm going to do something physical with my body mm -hmm. and see what can be worked out in that process. I love that you say that. Um, I've been looking at one of these questions that we received um, and I, it is so important, I think, that we touch on it because the question is, you know, you seem an optimistic person, and this could be directed for either one of us. Any advice to more on the depressed side? And I think it's so important that we address that because um, as we know, there is, you know, situational depression, which tends to happen a lot um, in, the, in the workplace, right? Which is very different. Um, um, than sort of like a clinical, um, you know, biological um, depression, right? Um, and so, you know, I think this idea of of optimism, <laughs> and I should, and I think this is the first time that I'm sharing this publicly, um, but I am actually a person who uh, is diagnosed uh, with depression. Um, I am a, a person with high performing, um, depression, uh, and anxiety. And one of the things that I really had to learn was this, or, or sort of unlearn, um, was this idea that we are supposed to be optimistic and happy all the time, or otherwise something is wrong with us. So, you know, my, my personal advice to, uh, someone who is, you know, feeling that they're more on the depressed side is number one, sort of determine whether that depression is situational. Um, is it due to your job? It is, is it something that is lingering from the pandemic? Or is it something that is deeper that you need to look into 
Um, and, and the only sort of person who can, who can really help you with that is, is a professional. I would, I would highly recommend, um, a professional. Cause if someone had said you you have high performing, you know, depression and I would be like, what are you talking about? I'm just a Capricorn. That's who we are. Like, that's what we do, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, so much of it is really learning who you are, learning what your triggers are and having um, professional guidance and care, and if necessary, um, and if you believe in medication, something to help manage that. So I really just wanted to speak to that question um, directly, anyone who is dealing with depression, and specifically the person who asked that question. Um, another can question. I, can I just, oh, sure. Can I add sure. to the depression? Please. Um, and, and I love your perspective. And I think a lot of social workers would say, absolutely. And I think I have a little different perspective um, because I am a very old fashioned generalist uh, kind of social worker. Mm -hmm. And when I went to get my MSW, um, unlike a lot of the assignments in clinical assessment and diagnosis where you're given a case study and you're told what, you know, figure out the diagnosis. In my school, we were given a case study that had a diagnosis, but mm -hmm. our job was to identify all of the things outside of the person and the structure, structural implications that could cause the same behaviors. And so I think we have this tendency to always like throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I think that the old view that me, the generalist social worker had, and the more current view, which is pretty predominant in schools of social work, which is a clinical approach, I think they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think I when agree. when you put them together, it gives you a much, much bigger picture, you mm -hmm. know, as to what might be happening for you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I, I agree. Um, and again, I think it's so important given, um, you know, a large um, percentage of our audience here. Um, and so thank you so much. For sharing that. And I think that actually leads well into one of our next questions, which was about building a community as one ages and preferring the company of a younger cohort. Suggestions. I <laughs> love this question um, because, you know, obviously uh, we are friends and, and very uh, different in age, but I also have younger friends. I have uh, you know, friends of all ages. And I think that you, you learn something and get something of value from every one in your village. I think it is learning what you are in need of from that person. Like the person who I call on to talk about about, you know, this great cheese that I just found <laughs> may not be the same person that I call upon um, for guidance about, you know, writing a book that I'm working on, you know? And so um, I think we can learn a lot from being in the company of, of younger and older folks. And I think a big part of building that community um, is being open and being vulnerable and one of the reasons I feel that I'm able to have younger friendships is that they understand that I am growing. I don't, you know, I don't, one of my phrases and mantras is that I am not a grown woman. I am a growing woman and may I always be growing, right? And so this idea that I don't know everything, you coming to me just because I'm 20 years older or, or 30 years older does not mean that I have the answer to all of the things, right? I, so I think a part of building that community is allowing yourself to be vulnerable, allowing yourself to understand that you can learn from people of all ages and that you don't know everything. <laughs> 
despite your your big good old age, right? And so I think that to me, that vulnerability and being open and honest about that was one of the first steps, I think, of, of being able to, to be in community with younger folks. What about you, Lynn? I, I think you hit on two of the big points because, you know, ageism goes in both directions. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of older people who dismiss younger people just without listening, right? And some young people that dismiss older people. I think that, you know, again, you, you use, I think you were talking about humility and respect and knowing what you don't know and putting yourself in conversation with other people who are also in that same place. Yes. So I am 70, but there's still a lot of things I don't know. And, and one of the things I say is, you know, I am an expert of the past, <laughs> but the young people of today are the experts of now. Mm -hmm. And any innovation or any new thing, it always builds on the past, but it thinks about it in a new way, which is exactly what reinvention is, right? It's yeah. not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's taking what was and really reconfiguring it so that it's meaningful and relevant for today. I'm smiling because I'm remembering uh, a conversation we had about an environmental grant. I think it was like a climate justice grant that had come out. And um, someone had sent it to me, given the work that I do. And when I went to look at the, uh, uh, the requirements, you know, it was like you had to be <laughs> like 21 or younger. It was something like I, I could not believe the, the ageism <laughs> that was there. And I remember saying like, gosh, I wish people would be um, a little more thoughtful and understanding about the power of us learning from each other, right? And remember I was saying like, man, this grant would have been so powerful. Like I get that they under, you know, I get the, the need and the desire to encourage um, young change makers and how empowering it can be when we see young people like doing innovative and exciting things but I was like man this would have been so powerful if they paired a young change maker with a seasoned change maker <laughs> and have them come together to really think about you know how can we utilize this grant to bring about the change that we want to bring about in the world having that seasoned perspective having that young energy and zest, um, you know, to, to really like dig into the work in a way that we all did when we first started um, in our respective careers. Right. And so I, I love that you, that you say that because I do, I just think it is so very powerful what we can learn and how we can grow from being in conversation and in community and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and to share the hard things and the beautiful things and the exciting things, right? Like even you sharing, you know, just a little tidbit about yourself as, a, you know, coming, being raised as a generalist in social work, I am sure that sparks something in someone who is new to social work who might be listening because that's a perspective they never thought about or they never considered, right? And so, you know, to the person who is looking uh, to build community, allow yourself to be vulnerable um, when it comes to, you know, forming these uh, friendships and relationships. And it is a big part of, um, it is a big part of reinvention, right? And it is a big part, I think, too, of activism. Right. And, you know, Lynn, I'd love for you to speak to this because, you know, a big part of me transitioning from the Afro minimalist, a big part of you really confronting accidental icon. And I'm smiling so hard because I'm trying not to laugh, thinking about some of just the hilarious conversations and heartbreaking too conversations that you and I, they've been hilarious as of late. But initially, yes. I remember it being like super heartbreaking. 
um, you know, for both of us. And when we think about activism, one of the things that you and I ultimately came to was we have to be activists first and foremost for ourselves, right? Like that at, at the end of the day, that was what we were really getting at with our social media. How, how can I be the best activist and advocate for myself, my platform, my work, how I want to show up in the world, what I want people to see and know about me. So like, what are your thoughts around just activism generally, and also this personal activism, which I think is tied so much to reinvention? I am nodding like a fool, because <laughs> as he said so many things, and I mean, one of the things that I used to always talk about um, in my classes is I really deconstructed the word social worker and the associations that people had to it. And very mm -hmm. often I would say, okay, without thinking, I'm writing the word social worker on the board, say whatever comes to your mind. And it would be like, poor bleeding heart, mm. all of these negative stereotypes. And I would say that if you cannot advocate for yourself, you are not going to be able to advocate for a client because mm. we think it's so easy. Oh, we'll advocate for clients when we as social workers might be in a very oppressed situation right. ourselves. So until you can advocate for yourself as a social worker, the values that you have, you're not going to be 100% effective. So it does go back to what you said. But I want to bring it back to sort of the intergenerational aspect of activism. Because one of the things that we do in this area and time that we have of specializing and putting things in silos is that if we looked at social issues from an intergenerational perspective in intergenerational groups, we would see that an issue that people are putting in the box of older people actually impacts younger people and mm. middle-aged people. And I'm going to mm -hmm. use the, the example of home health care, right? When you hear that, you think older person Definitely. in need of care. Mm -hmm. But you play that out and guess who that's impacting because we don't have good po policies. It's impacting you, my dear, my yep. middle-aged daughter, <laughs> He's going to have to come into my home and pick up the slack. And then right. she's going to have to find somebody to help her take care of her kids because she's taking care of me. Mm. And the kids are not going to benefit because their parent is being stressed and overburdened from caregiving. So yeah. it's not an issue about age. It's an issue that affects women. Mm -hmm. all throughout their lifespan. And if you look at affordable housing, if you look at the environment, if you look at um, childcare, you know, I've just come off a year of providing childcare yeah. for my grandson because my daughter only had six weeks maternity leave and it was a lot of viruses and stuff <laughs> happening. I, I remember our phone calls and you were writing. You he were was writing. on my, he was strapped to me as I'm writing this book. And yeah. so that means older women who need more income are losing income because they're mm -hmm. helping their, their children. And so you see every issue really is an intergenerational issue. But yeah. we put them up into all these pies, like young person. Young people are the only ones who really care about the environment, and older people ruined it. Well, that's yeah. not true. I, not I, true. I was on a trip upstate, and I met this 70-year-old activist who had single-handedly 
changed the whole way that their water system was dealt with mm -hmm. in the Delaware Valley. Right. So, and again, she worked with young people in doing that. So, yeah. so for me, activism begins with claiming your space at the table mm -hmm. and being an activist for yourself. And then it continues as long as you start inviting different generations to your table. Oh, I love that. I love that analogy. I'm like, is that in the book? <laughs> Did you sneak that in at the end? I, I think I, I might. That. I did. I think I did. <laughs> I hope so. Um, you know, I'm looking at the time. I want to make sure we get to some of these um, other questions. And I think one thing that you just said made me think about, uh, and I remember when this question came through and I was like, oh, I hope we're able to weave this into the conversation. And it is how slash why do you think many women just watch and admire stylish women, but don't change anything in their lives. And I would, I would, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add to your question because I think it's just watch and admire even other women, but not change anything in their own lives. Because yes, there's the whole style situation, but I think that can be. There are so many different variables for why, right? Like I could look at a stylish woman and be like. Mm, Love that handbag, certainly not buying that for $5,000. And so, yeah, I may not make that change, but I think just watching and admiring others, but not changing anything, I think it it's exactly what you just said, which is first and foremost, being able to be that activist and advocate for yourself and creating a, a seat at the table for yourself. Um, when that question came through, it made me think early, early on in uh, the social media era, when it really was about community and, you know, we didn't have, I, there weren't even um, reels. I mean, you couldn't even do a carousel. It was like one post, your little regular phone, you would post something, you might come back five, six hours later. And there was this, um, yoga content creator and she would just post like all these amazing poses and photos and you know it would just be so beautiful and uh, her name was Laura I can't remember her last name but I would look at Laura's account all the time and I had to say to myself watching someone do yoga I'm not doing yoga <laughs> but I would feel so good looking at her her account but I'm not doing yoga right and one day uh she had posted she had done a post and she said you know i'm so curious as to why someone would follow my account and then unfollow my account right and again this is she's not an influencer not this name was just like i'm building community i thought i'm part of this yogi community like why are people following me and then unfollowing me and someone commented and said it could be because they feel very intimidated, because them watching you makes them feel a way about themselves and their own practice or what they're doing and not or not doing, right? Um, and I think this idea as to why we watch and admire but don't change is something that is an internal question. Right. That has to be answered. Like it, it's not a general sort of thing. Right. Like for me, I had to say, why, why am I just watching and admiring Laura doing all these poses instead of getting on my own mat, you know, and I didn't, I just didn't want to get on my mat. Like at the end of the day, I would rather, I enjoyed watching her do it than doing it myself. And that was something I had to challenge myself and say, if I want to be that good of a yogi, I need to get on my mat, right? But it, I don't think it's something general that how and to why, that how and why we just watch and admire, but don't change. I think that's an individual sort of question that needs to be answered. What do you, what do you think, I, Lynn? I would completely agree. I think, I think the question is, 
you know, and again, we're not asking people enough questions. Right. And so I think that could be a good use of social media is to ask a question that makes people stop mm -hmm. and think through what am I feeling when I look at that and where right. is that coming from? Right. Right. And I heard something today on this amazing podcast where the person was talking about this very thing, where you we all have wants and we all have needs. And when we see somebody who has something we want and need, we can have a couple of different kinds of responses, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things that he said which just blew me away is that you could look at somebody doing something and instead of feeling envious, you could say, isn't it wonderful that we have so many people in the world that can do very different things? I love that. And you're not using it against yourself. I think, mm. I think really the, the problem with social media is that people are looking and for various reasons, they're using it against themselves. They're judging, using, judging yes, themselves. They're yeah. using it to create self-harm. It's a virtual yeah. kind of self-harming. You know, yeah. in, in, I did a post once when, you know, and again, you get very infected mm. by these standards that are being thrown in front of our face in social media. And at one point during doing the accidental icon, and, and I just want to make this point, I realized writing my book that when I began to lose myself was when I retired as a professor. Mm -hmm. And what people don't know is that from 2014 until 2019, I was both a professor and a social worker and the accidental icon. And I realized in looking back that when I left, that I had lost my footing in the real world. And I became this inhabitant of a digital world, which is not a real world. It's not, right. it's disembodied, it's, it's not real. And mm -hmm. so I became, I internalized some of those things and I would be looking and I would be sometimes comparing oh for sure and so i really had to understand that i sort of had contracted this virus that i had to get some good medicine for and yeah. i had to you know sort of move away into real life into taking care of my grandchildren into putting my hands in the dirt of my garden um, yeah. into my local community to sort of refine myself. And now when I look at that, you know, it's not something I judge myself by. It's yeah. not a standard I use. There's also like a forced comparison, I think, that happens sometimes too. Um, and I think that can be interesting and strange <laughs> online, right? Um, you know, when I declared myself the Afro minimalist and I'm showing my journey. And it's so funny to look at like photos from five, six years ago when I thought my house was as minimalist as it would ever be. Cause it was for me, like I had gone from, you know, four bedrooms to, you know, a 630 square foot condo. And I was just like, Oh, I, this is it. I have gotten rid of everything. And I look back on those photos now and I'm like, Oh my God, it was so much stuff. Anyway. Um, I remember going through my journey and as I just kept, you know, less and less and less and talking about the journey and sharing parts of the journey, you know, someone saying, how many things do you have? I, I bet I, I bet I have less things than you. And I was like, <laughs> who cares? Like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, so sometimes that comparison you aren't even trying to be a part of that comparison and judging, which I think is why it's so important that you are so aware that you are an advocate and an activist for yourself. Like I didn't even allow myself 
to go down that journey. I was like, I don't count my things. It's not about me. Like I'm not counting in that way. Right. Like if I'm counting, it is to take inventory and being like, why do I have 52 pairs of jeans and I only wear the same two? Right. Like that is, that's, that's what I'm counting. <laughs> um, but I just thought it was so interesting because there are people online comparing themselves to you based on this alternate reality almost because it's just a snapshot um, of our lives and that is giving them some sort of pleasure, joy, whatever they are getting from it. But it's not, you know, you don't have to engage and be involved in that way. So I think that's also um, really powerful. You know, Lynn, you have so many social workers out here who love and admire you. So many of your students who are here and I'm sure who asked some of these questions. And I really want to dig into a few social work specific questions. Um, and one of those questions is advice that you would give to social workers about making changes from micro work. Do you know, like, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> okay. So in social work, micro is working at a micro level, which means you're working predominantly with the individual, right? And then there's mezzo, which you start branching out into the family and the local community. And then there's macro, which is a larger society and the structures and the culture and all of that. And again, social work, at its best, is the smartest profession because if you use all three levels in thinking about the problem that is coming before you as a social worker, that it offers you the most complex way of thinking about the problem and it multiplies the potential solutions by thousands. Mm. But for various reasons, which I'm not going to go into here, over time, social work has moved more away from that larger vision. And a lot of it is because of how poorly we were paid to do that sort of generalist micro, mezzo, macro social work. Um, and it's moved into many social workers becoming therapists and clinicians because that is one of the ways that you can earn an income that allows you to pay off your student loans. Allows you to and, live. <laughs> yes, yes. And things like community organizing and things like you know, group work are less valued by society and it reflects in what you're paid as a social worker. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, there are social workers, the person who probably asked this question is seeing the limitations of only seeing a client at the micro level. Okay. So what I would say to them is go back and read about settlement houses. Okay. And this time we have uncovered the history, not only of settlement houses that were started by white women, but settlement houses that were started by black women mm -hmm. and find out how they did that because they did it brilliantly. Love and they that. also use the arts and they use creativity to do it. And mm. there's a story that I really love about Jane Addams, who is kind of the mother of my kind of social work. And mm -hmm. she bought this old house in Chicago and she wanted to sort of serve the immigrants and the community. And it was also for her the only way that she was allowed to be outside of her house as a woman and not get married and have a family. So she kind of took a private house and made okay. it public, right? I love that. So how she began, she and her partner, Ellen, 
um, they stood on the front porch and they just waited. Mm -hmm. And finally, after a few weeks, a woman with a baby dragging along a nine-year-old went up to them, put the baby in their arms and said, you know, I've been watching you two doing nothing. And rather than my nine-year-old not going to school because I have to go work in a factory and she has to watch the baby, you watch the baby so she can go to school and I can go to the factory. And that is how the first program, Hull House Nursery, was born. I love that. And that oh. that is create that's how to be a social worker. That I... is creative problem solving. I, I, oh, I love that so much. Okay. My gosh, we only have like five to seven minutes left. Okay. What are some key ideas to keep in mind when working with a multi-generational team on nuanced issues? And I, I also want to add, I think you just sort of answered one of these other questions, which was, does reinvention mean sacrificing partnership? If your partner is not going to stand on the porch <laughs> with you, <laughs> you know, um, y'all should have a have a conversation about that. I don't think you should ever have to sacrifice, um, you know, a, a part of yourself, um, you know, that is going to leave you feeling less than or that you would even call it a sacrifice or partner, right? right. If you and, are, if, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, but that reflects a very individualist, which mm -hmm. unfortunately our society like privileges so much that we do yeah. everything as an individual, when in fact the best reinventions are done in collaboration, Love right? It. And our own mm -hmm. story is an example of that. Yeah. That we really started this journey together Mm -hmm. And very much said to each other, we want to reinvent who we have become, who society has positioned us, and let's do it together. Yeah. Because that is fun, and that is life-giving, and again, you mentioned how often we laugh and, mm -hmm. you know, talk you more than me, talking me <laughs> off the ledge, but I think I think it's done, the best things in life are done in community. That I here I am 70 years old and I'm saying it, is that that is where the joy and the happiness and the adventure and, you know, sometimes you need someone to hold you during the reinvention yeah. process, right? You do. And I think also the beautiful thing about community and, and, and partnership is this idea that, you know, the people who love you and who are closest to you can see parts of you that you cannot, you know? And so, so much of our conversation, you know, like if you come to me or if I come to you and I'm like, womp, 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 you know, you're like, girl, do you know who you are? I mean, blah, blah, you know, and, and vice versa, right? Like we're able to uplift each other and challenge each other and encourage each other in ways that we are just not able to do for ourselves, right? I can encourage myself, I can uplift myself, but it is going to look very different when someone in my community does that for me. What are some key ideas to keep in mind when working with a multi-generational team on nuanced issues, in addition to what we just said? <laughs> Well, I think, you know, I think we talked about this before. I think it's um, really late. This is group work 101, right? Mm -hmm. And that really is laying down the ground rules of mm -hmm. how you want that group to function and having the group participate in that process. And yeah. there is some classic group work called... Um, sort of articles, casework in a group, but there's a whole literature on mutual aid groups that mm -hmm. really speak to this issue. Mm -hmm. And that that really it is the skill of the facilitator, right? In in getting it's it's how do you deal with difference? That's the question. Yeah. We make it, we want to put it in these languages, but at the end of the day is how do you help people find pleasure 
And how do you find people, help people find excitement in mm -hmm. exploring difference? Because yeah. that's how change occurs. We, I love that. We have a, um, a new wild card question that just came in, which I think is such a wonderful way to end our discussion tonight. And it's about the title of your book. Yes. Uh, How to be old, which of course I love. <laughs> right. And, you know, the question is, how do you feel about turning 70? How do you appreciate the moment and not dwell on mortality? And this is coming um, from someone who's, who's 67. But I think that question can be asked of anyone who uh, has had to sort of confront mortality, whether that comes from, you know, a death in the family, you know, an injury or an illness. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait a minute, I am not going to live forever. Right. And what I think is so powerful about the title, how to be old is it's pulling people in because we all want to know how can I be old out here and be happy and whole and living my life and, and reinventing myself and reimagining what's possible in every decade of my life and understanding that aging is a, a, a gift and a blessing, right? How do you, how do you, Lynn Slater, appreciate the moment and not dwell on more mortality? Or do you find yourself dwelling on mortality sometimes? Well, I think at the age of 70, you know, to be honest, there are moments where I do think about it. Mm -hmm. um, but again, because I have this reinvention attitude towards life, you know, my family jokes with me and they say, oh, you're going to reinvent your death somehow. And so, you know, I've been having these fun talks <laughs> and you would not use the word fun for this. But there's all these new ways of being buried that are very organic and green and, you know, position you in the earth so that you're supporting new life and things like yes. that. I, I personally find that much more exciting than my daughter picking out a coffin and holding my mm -hmm. ashes. Um, but I think the flip side is that if you deny it, right, you miss the opportunity that it gives you to appreciate every moment of your life mm -hmm. that living in the moment becomes more important really finding you know your joy in very simple things you know yeah. like having a cup of coffee on your back porch this does not require aging well does not require you know, unlimited resources like the media suggests it does. Mm -hmm. It really is, you know, again, always like I'm a pragmatist, right? Everything in life has good things about it, not so mm -hmm. good things about it and presents challenges. Yeah. Every decade of my life, I have opp had opportunities, I have had challenges, I have had losses, I have had gains, and I have developed the skills over time to deal with those. Mm -hmm. This is no different. Right. Being old is the same, but different. All those skills that you have practiced in every decade before are what you are going to bring to those challenges. Mm -hmm. And that is going to help you be realistic, not deny them, but also not fear them or pretend they don't exist. And the way right. the media is portraying aging right now, they would suggest that you just pretend you're going to be young forever, run marathons when you're 85, be totally well-resourced, and that is not the truth of the majority of us aging. Which right? is why you wrote your book and it is fabulous and it addresses all of these <laughs> questions. And I'm I'm not just saying that as a shameful plug for my shameless plug for my friend. Um, but I know that to be true because you know, I was with you when you were writing the book. We've talked about some of these topics and we've talked about what a disservice um 
you know, society has done when it comes to talking about aging, um, specifically for women, um, but just aging in general, you know, and to the folks who are asking questions that are like, I'm 60, how do I reinvent myself? Or I'm, you know, I'm in my mid 60s. Uh, you know, I, I want to have a fashion career online. The thing is to just do it. Yeah. Well, right. Let, like, there... <laughs> just, just one thing I want to remind women about, right? Because I always get asked to do this 50 plus style interviews. <laughs> and so basically, I'm being very bad, you know, and provocative. Mm -hmm. But basically, as a woman, from the time you're transitioning from childhood to adolescence, your body is constantly changing, right? You're, you know, getting your period, you're being bloated, you're losing weight, you're gaining weight, you may be pregnant, you're then you're not pregnant, you're having menopause. So the question is not what is 50 plus clothing like? The question is, how do I dress a body that's always changing? Because I'm yeah. a woman. Yeah. And, so and I'm I, always changing. <laughs> I, yeah. And, and, and I again. am always changing. Yeah. And so again, it's just like every other decade. How do I address, how do I respond to, how do I think about the opportunities, the challenges, the losses that are happening to me in my life and to my body? Um, and that, my friends, you do have a little bit of control over. In fact, you have 100% control over how you choose to think about these things. Yes, and how you show up in the world. I cannot... Thank you enough, Lynn, for being in conversation. Uh, Fordham University, this has been so wonderful. Your students are so lucky to have a school of social service that is willing to put on an event like this and really allow us to have a very open and honest conversation about some of the topics that I know so many people are thinking about caring about um, in their professional and personal lives. And so, uh, Dr. McPhee, thank you so very much. This has just been so wonderful. And of course, Dr. Lynn Slater, not just accidental icon, no longer accidental. Um, always such a joy being in conversation with you. I have learned so much from you. Um, I would have loved to have been in one of your classes. Um, <laughs> You're and I in just, my classes. They I just am. I am in on your... the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in your master class, man. Um, and so just thank you all to everyone who tuned in tonight. Thank you for your thought-provoking questions and for joining us for this conversation. And uh, please check out my dear friend's book, how to be old, which debuts next Tuesday on March 12th. We're super uh, excited. I could not have wanted to be in conversation with anyone else <laughs> and to bring anyone else back to my home. <laughs> and I want to make a plug for your book, Afro Minimalist, because Thank it's you. not about things. It's about so much more. And it is really about how our histories and our culture and our ancestors and all of those things impact how we think about the things in our life, how we think about what we spend our money on, how we think about how we view ourselves and what makes us worthwhile. And actually reading something in your book was another trigger for me to understand like a very scarcity view that kind of informed my actions. So just please, yeah. it's an amazing book. You'll learn interesting things about Black history as you read it, but it is a book for everyone. Yes. And so I, I, I love it. I love you. 
Oh, I love Fordham you. GSS. I love all my old students. <laughs> if you're both. here, I miss you. I'm jumping. We miss you. Uh, but thank you for sharing yourself, both of you for sharing yourself tonight and for a wonderful conversation. And thank you for everyone who's joined us from all over. Uh, we shall do this again. Please. Have yes. a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.